Uh, so here I am actually in person, <laughs> Eve Stone. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, everything was going to be all set up in advance. I was here early, but then I realized I came without my power cord. So I went back to my office. <laughs> um, so I guess um, before I start, are there any questions about that course, about like course requirements or anything like that that I covered the first time? Or should I get straight to trying to explain shelling, which? <laughs> Uh, well, we'll see what I can do. And let's see, here's another screw up. I thought I printed out my notes, but now I can't find the printer. Oh. Uh, my life. When my kids make fun of me, they're like, they're like, this is dad. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but, right, focus. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to say just a little bit about very little about shelling as a person. Um, and then I'm going to dive into trying to explain what's going on in this reading. Um, Let's see, his full name is Friedrich Wilhelm Josef Schelling. All these guys have the same first name, like Friedrich something. Um, and his dates are 1775, 1854. Um, so um, he actually lived relatively long. This is Hegel died in 1832, I think. So um, uh, he lived long enough to have a later phase, which was quite different than his earlier phase, which I don't know too much about or understand very well. Um, it's even harder than the earlier phase. But um, fortunately for us, it's the early phase that was more influential on the people we're going to look at going forward. Um, and so I think, as I said last time, he was one of the three And this is kind of in order. The first one was Fichte. Um, so Fichte is already like a senior figure that Schelling is trying to negotiate with at this point. Then Schelling, now this is like kind of, I mean, Hegel and Schelling were actually roommates. They, Hegel, Schelling, and the poet, kind of mystical poet, Holderin were actually roommates at the uh, Lutheran seminary in Tübingen. So, uh, so they're, you know, Hegel and Schelling are roughly the same age, although as I said, Schelling lived longer. But Schelling kind of came to prominence first and then afterwards Hegel. Also, this is kind of in order of how good they are, I think they are. <laughs> so, you know, if I had to teach a course about one person in the 19th century, it might be Hegel. But if I had to teach a course about the 19th century, I thought about it for a while and I just like, um, it seemed like Schelling was more the way to go in terms of telling a continuous story of what happened during the 19th century. So that's why I put that in the pen. As I said before, sometimes I teach Hegel's logic. Maybe I'll do that again soon. I don't know. Um, that's the most important part of Hegel, I think, is his, his logic. Um, but so anyway, so you know, they're roommates together. Um, and they're both getting excited about Kant, but especially about Kant as interpreted and extended by Fichte. And to begin with, they would kind of work together, Schelling and Hegel. But eventually, um, first, they both kind of diverged from Fichte. And this book, although 
So every time you see him talking about the science of knowledge, that's how he translates this. Right? Anyway, Wissenschaft means science, and Lehre means like doctrine or theory. By the way, I should see if any of this is coming out on the. Oh, wait, it's the wrong camera. It is half cut off. No one has joined by Zoom, but I'm hoping someone will watch the recording. Yeah. The problem is, I'm afraid this camera is blocking your view. Right? No, it's okay. Let's see how much. That's better. Right. So, Wissenschaft Lehre means like theory of science. And this was Fichte's big book, the Wissenschaft Lehre. So every time Schelling talks about that, he's kind of aligning himself with Fichte. He's saying, you know, my interpretation of Kant is along the lines of Fichte's. But uh, in fact, when Fichte saw this book, he said, I know this isn't me. <laughs> and he thought it wasn't him because it's too, it's not subjective enough. So I mean, I try to. Well, I won't try to explain what Fischer, why Fischer thought that, but we'll try to we'll get in more into the subjective objective thing, obviously. That's, so that was the issue between them. And then later, Schelling and Hegel diverged from each other and started attacking each other and became like rivals. Um, and uh, actually, I guess I would say that there, the issue was that Hegel thought that Schelling was too subjective. <laughs> that was that was the territory these people were fighting over. Like, what's the right balance between subjective and objective? Um, okay, was there anything else I wanted to say? Um, Right, so I mean, so again, like if the whole course were about Schelling, we might start with part of this book, but also we'd want to study his philosophy of nature, which he was developing around the same time. And then we probably look at that later stuff, um, which some people really liked, although uh, Kierkegaard attended Schelling's later lectures. And he actually wrote home to a friend that uh, he said, Schelling talks infinite nonsense in both an extensive and an intensive sense. <laughs> Meaning it's like infinitely much nonsense and it's infinitely <laughs> nonsensical. That was Kierkegaard's reaction. But in any case, um, again, the, this book, although it's pretty early Schelling and in some ways he hasn't completely broken free of Fichte yet, is what was really influential on Coleridge especially. And it was so influential on Coleridge. How do we know that this was very influential on Coleridge? Coleridge actually translated pieces of it and included it in his own biographical literaria without attribution. <laughs> so Schelling was so influenced by this that he plagiarized from it. <laughs> I mean, sorry, Coleridge was so influenced by this that he plagiarized from it. Um, a famous or infamous scandal in the history of thought. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, what we're going to be reading from Coleridge is not that. Um, not surprisingly, that's not really his best work. He felt like he could just throw in some stuff from someone else in the middle. Um, but, uh, but that's how we know that Coleridge actually read this pretty carefully. Um, and so, are there any questions about any of that? If there are, I might not know the answer, but... I'm not really a historian, <laughs> um, although I'm very interested in the history of philosophy. 
but and bit by bit, I get dragged into knowing more details of what happened in the real world to try to understand it. <laughs> um, all right, so the only other thing I want to say before I start talking about the book is that uh, the translation, as I mentioned before, is um, unfortunately not very good. Um, and the way it's not good is like, not that he doesn't know German. His German, I'm sure, is 100 times better than mine, more, more than 100 times better than mine. But um, he's not, he doesn't translate it as if it were a technical work. This is a very common problem in philosophy translations. In particular, he doesn't, there's important technical terms that Schelling uses, and he makes no effort to translate them consistently. So the same word which Schelling, you know, is attaching a lot of importance to gets translated in like five different ways, depending on what sounds best in that context. Um, now, like, I mean, it's impossible to avoid that completely from your when you're translating from German into English. Um, I mean, unless you were to make the English into a kind of code for the German. Um, that, this actually is the way that medieval translations work. Right, like when they translated Greek into Latin, the Latin is like it's not real Latin. It's like Greek coded foreign Latin words. But unless you're willing to do that, yeah, I mean you can't be completely consistent. But he, I feel like, isn't even making an effort. So, um, you know, unfortunately, if you are reading in the translation, there's not that much you can do about that. I'm going to try to call attention sometimes to what the original says, but um, um, you should just know that that's going on and it's unfortunate. Okay, so as I said before, this time I'm going to focus mostly not on the preface or the introduction, but on part one of the book itself, which is about the first principle of knowledge. This is like the first time I've used chalk since November of 2019. <laughs> it's very exciting. I like chalk. All right. Um, so, um, right, so I'm, I'm blocking the view of someone watching through the camera. All right. Um, and um, as I also said last time, you can look at this as a, uh, an attempt to defend a kind of rationalist epistemology. So, um, right, because According to empiricists, there is no first principle of knowledge. Or rather, there's lots of first principles of knowledge, namely all of our experiences. Right? Each one of them is a first principle. We don't demonstrate it from something else. It's rational to want to look for a first principle of knowledge. Um, and as I also said last time, this has something to do with the question of um, how we can get a synthetic proposition now you know i'm writing equals here for the copula is because shelling does that. right in other words we say a is b Schelling symbolizes that A equals B. But in a synthetic proposition, the whole point of a synthetic proposition is that these are not the same. So this equal sign doesn't mean, or at least it doesn't exactly mean that A and B are the same. It means they're somehow connected together into one. So that's so the question of a first principle of knowledge is somehow connected to this. How can we get a synthetic proposition from an analytic or identical proposition? 
And the way Schelling writes that is A equals A. So why is it about that? Yeah. So, so the first synthetic proposition, are the uh, A and B always sort of things, or could one of them be imaginary? Right. So A and B are concepts, or I mean, they're presentations. I'm going to write this in place where it's just about. Presentation is a translation of the German word Vorstellung. Vorstellung means like, so for means before, both in the sense of before in time and also in the sense of like in front of you. So, and Stellung means like placing. So, Vorstellung means like putting something in front or putting something forward or something. Um, traditionally, Vorstellung was used as a translation of the Latin term representatio. And for that reason, you'll often see it translated as a representation. And if I were choosing, I would translate it as representation. That's the way it's translated in Kant translations, for example. But, uh, but you will also often see it translated as presentation because people say there's no re in it. It's just present presenting, right? So, Anyway, so these are some kind of presentations. And the kind they are is conceptual. So, right, right. So the example of a synthetic proposition, this is Kant's example. And this example I gave last time is all bodies are heavy. Which is the universal law of gravitation, law of universal gravitation. All bodies are heavy. So um, A is body, and B is heavy. And it's synthetic because supposedly um, gravity, heaviness, is not included in our concept of a body, something added to it. Okay, that was a good question. Yes. So, happiness for the perfect predicate distinction between A and A, like A and B. Yeah. I'm wondering if that could put A and A uh, represented in our subject of self. So, is that just an example to where A and A can be? I'm just, I was just really confused <laughs> on the discussion about the self and where you from. It is, it is very confusing, I agree. Self equals self is gonna be, or you know, as I mentioned before, self, or the self is Heath's translation of German, das ich, right? Which ich is just the word for I in German, right? So, so what it really says in German is like I equals I. Sometimes, I think in a few places Heath actually writes this, but usually writes self equals self. So the point, so this is going to be the proposition that um, um, Schelling is going to say we need to look for a proposition that's both analytic and synthetic, which seems impossible because they're right, they're defined as contradictory opposites. But Schelling is going to say this is the proposition that's both analytic and synthetic. It's so it looks like this, but in some important way, it's also like this. All right, but so I'm not getting to that yet because, like, let's you know, let's talk about the normal examples first. I guess I mean Schelling doesn't spend any time on them, but that's because he assumes that you've read Kant and you already have those examples in mind. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, um, are there other questions about this before I go on? So why is the question of a first principle of knowledge about the relationship between these things? I guess I should say one more thing about analytic propositions before I go on. So, you know, I mean, strictly speaking, analytic and identical are not the same. 
identical means, you know, like all bodies are bodies, a tautology. So, right, so they would literally be A equal K. Um, but of course, no one thinks you get knowledge out of that. How do you get knowledge, you know, according to rationalists? Well, it's, it's really going to be something like this. Can people see that or is it too low there? Right there, or maybe I should say, B plus B equals B, where this whole thing is A, right? It's called analytic because analysis means taking apart into pieces. You know, so the example of this, the Kant gives is all bodies are extended, which is an important e example in Descartes and the other rationalists, right? We look into my concept of body and see what is in there. Well, a body is an extended substance, right? So like B might be extended and C might be substance. Um, but by analyzing A to its parts, you can see that all bodies are extended is at bottom an identical proposition or is true because the law of identity, right? Because it's really the B here that's equal to B there that makes it true. Again, writing equals here, you know, is, is again kind of weird, right? All bodies are extended doesn't mean body is the same thing as extendedness. It means bodies are extended and they have other properties too, perhaps, right? So um, that's, so in other words, this, this like pseudo mathematical notation is really actually not very helpful, but, uh, um, it actually took a long time, and this is a this could be a separate course about 19th century philosophy, which would touch completely different people. It took a long time for philosophers to find a use of mathematical looking notation that wasn't basically just like hand waving. <laughs> hey, it was like Frege and people at the very end of the 19th century, Russell, who figured out how, something like that. But so these people like to look scientific by writing things as equations. But really, you know, it's, I mean, if B plus C really equals B, then C would have to be zero, right? <laughs> so, so, but anyway, so, so just keep in mind that this equal just means is. The is of, of predication. And you can see that B plus C is B because B is B. All right. Um, so the, the question I was about to ask though, before those, those other questions, which were good questions is like, so why is looking for a first principle of knowledge about trying to get this out of this? And um, so what is knowledge? Is it okay if I erase this stuff now? Well, so in knowledge, right? Like here's the mind. This is like a head, <laughs> right? And we have a presentation. And the presentation is about something. It refers to something. So like if this presentation were the concept force, it refers to forces. Um, and the thing it refers to is called its object. 
right? So object here always means the object of a presentation. The thing the presentation is about. Um, I mean, that's that's important to keep track of what's going on in this stuff. We nowadays use object like as kind of synonymous with thing, right? Like how many objects are there on the table? That's like an absolute use of object. You don't have to ask object of what. But um, but that's a new use of object. That's not the way Shaw uses it. This is more like, you know, like what's the object of your desire? Right, it's that use of object only. This is a theoretical case, not right. It's not desire. It's representation. Okay, so um, so the presentation is about something, and the thing that's about is this object. And meanwhile, the presentation is an act or like state of something. Right, it doesn't just float on its own. It's in a mind, and that thing that it's in is its subject. So every presentation has a subject that it's like the state of that thing, a property of that thing, right? So it's like a property of my mind that it has that it's representing a horse. And then it also has an object, which is what it refers to. However, this is still not enough for count to count as knowledge. For knowledge, there has to be some kind of and here, um, again, I have to complain about the translation. He usually translates this as coincidence. Um, the German word is Übereinstimmung. Which means, um, well, I mean, it means agreement basically, or conformity. Or, I mean, Stimmung actually, this is like, it means like being in tune with something. Übereinstimmung <laughs> means, I don't know how to translate it literally, but, but it means agreement. That would be a much better translation here. There has to be an agreement between the presentation and its object to count as knowledge. They have to be in harmony with each other. That is, the object has to really be the way I'm representing it. So the problem is, though, um, how can we know about, or even so much as think about this kind of agreement between a presentation and this object. And this is a problem, this is always a problem, and it's a problem that tends to lead towards some form of idealism. And the problem is that so I want to think about the object as it's represented here and compare it with the object itself. But how can I so much as think of the object without using a representation? Right? That is, when I compare the object as it's represented to the object itself, I'm just comparing the object as it's represented to the object as I represent it. I can't actually get around outside and see the object naked without a representation. Okay, so I mean, there's like, you know, various responses to this. Um, uh, but uh, Shelley's response to it is um, that this is why knowledge always consists of propositions. So knowledge never actually consists in just thinking a horse and there being a horse. Knowledge consists in the agreement is going to be between, um, first of all, there's one thing that already somehow has become an object. 
that's the subject of the preposition. Now, uh, I have to apologize. There's nothing to be done about this, but, but it's really confusing because we're talking about subject and object in this sense. And we're also talking about subject and predicate of proposition, right? But um, the subject of the proposition is something that already somehow has become an object for me. So I already am representing it. I've like succeeded in representing it, basically. And the agreement is going to consist in me claiming something else about that thing I'm already representing. And then seeing that the two really agree with each other. And that something else is the predicate of the proposition. Right, so if I think, you know, like horses have four legs. <laughs> um, so the subject horse is the thing that already somehow is an object for me, never mind how. And now the knowledge, so 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 now the knowledge claim, so to speak, is that I assert. I take this other representation, it has four legs, and I say it applies to that thing that I already am representing. And the agreement that constitutes knowledge will be then if I find that indeed it does apply to that thing that I'm already representing. So the agreement or harmony that constitutes knowledge is between my representation, between my subject representation and my predicate representation. And that gets rid of this spooky thing of trying to get around and thinking what the object is without representing it. Right now, we're comparing two things that I actually have in my mind. And I can think, do they agree with each other or not? So now, um, Getting back to A equals B versus A equals A. Say, well, okay, so I understand you're gonna check for agreement between your representation or presentation. I should remember to say presentation because that's who's translation, but um, um, so you know, well, actually, let me instead of let me just introduce these neutral letters first. Subject equals predicate, right? So how what, what am I checking when I check if they agree with each other? Like, what am I even thinking when I think that they agree with each other? Or what am I claiming when I claim that they agree with each other? And the rationalists say, well, I must be claiming, the, you know, like, how can I think of this agreeing with this? Only by thinking that somehow contained in this was already Right, so Leibniz in particular is very explicit about this. Everything, you know, true that I claim about anything is, is has to be something that was already part of its content. That's, you know, I didn't ask, I couldn't ask for a show of hands last time. How many people here took 100 E? <laughs> oh, 100 B is the rational. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so you've read some Leibniz. I hope Leibniz is the rational sound. Okay. So, right. So, you know that like Leibniz ends up with this monadology where, like, you know, um, every substance is, 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 you know, is the object of some infinitely complicated representation, some infinitely complicated concept. Only God has those concepts clearly, but we have them in a confused way. And when we learn about things, all we're doing is clarifying those concepts and finding out what was included in them already, right? So, and, and Leibniz says it has to be that way because how else can you think of two, presentations is agreeing with 
So, I mean, this works pretty well for all bodies are extended, but then the empiricists are going to point out, like, okay, what about the concept chimera? So, uh, This is like the main. It has a lion's head, and it has a goat head coming out of it. And then it has a tail, a snake's head. Right. <laughs> so, except of course there is no tail. Right. So you know, like I can look into my concept chimera, and I can form these great propositions. Like all chimeras have a goat head coming out of their back. But that's not knowledge. Um, all I'm learning about is the content of my own presentation, which, if I put them together arbitrarily in the first place, then um, uh, there's no reason to think that they represent anything, even anything possible. As I mentioned last time, you know, an example of this, it's actually Leibniz's example, but that's a complicated reason. But an example of this is um, like the fastest speed or the largest number, right? I can form these concepts and I can analyze them and find, you know, and do all these kind of like A equals A type of things. The largest number is larger than any other number. The only problem is that there can't be a largest number. I'm not thinking about anything. So for knowledge, I need some kind of constraint. I need um, conditions, or limits. These are things you'll, you'll, you'll see Schelling talking about constantly. I need some kind of limit that tells me which things I can put together in the first place before I begin any of this analyzing stuff. So according to empiricists, of course, the constraint or limit is experience. And that's why there is no first principle. And I can't deduce knowledge from anything. I have to wait and see what things come together. That's how I get knowledge. Afterwards, I can think about it and try to clarify my concepts if I want. But I'm not getting any knowledge that way, right? That's the empiricist point of view. But there's some problems with the empiricist point of view as Hume um, I guess most uh, fundamentally pointed out. Like, for example, what about the proposition? Um, every event is an effect. This is the law of causation, right? It says that nothing happens unless there was a cause. How do I learn that? So Hume says it's not analytic. Um, right? There's nothing in the concept of something happening that includes something else that made it happen. Um, but I certainly didn't learn it from experience. How, do you, how can you tell I didn't learn it from experience? Well, learning from experience means having sensations and attributing to their external cause. So I had to already know this. <laughs> so Hume essentially concludes that, well, you, yeah, I don't want to try to summarize Hume. <laughs> um, you could say, Hume, I mean, you could say Hume concludes we don't really know anything, but that's not really his conclusion because he says we can't believe that, right? So his conclusion is if you think about it too hard, you'll start to think that you can't really know anything. So don't think about it too hard, <laughs> right? So, um, but, um, but this sets the stage for Kant coming in and saying, aha, 
there's a special kind of synthetic proposition that we don't learn from a dream. And they say, you know, the empiricists are right in general that when we say A equals B, what does this equal mean? It means that, um, it means that whenever we experience the object of A, we also experience it as B. Right? So the equality is in the object, not in us. And um, we find out about it because we find these two things coming together. This is learning from experience as we would normally think of it. Right? Like, how do we know that all bodies are heavy? Well, after fooling around with bodies for a long time, someone, Newton, <laughs> says, hey, you know what they all have in common? They're all heavy. <laughs> and then you go back over your experiences, and you're like, yeah, sure enough, the moon, if you understand what heavy means, you'll realize that that's why the moon goes around, because it's heavy, and the tides, because water is heavy, and the moon, you know, Right, so um, so we learn from experience that whenever we see the object of this, we also see or feel rather the object of this. Um, but there's this special cases where we couldn't have learned from experience, and yet there are conditions of possibility for all experience. So Kant's point of view is, or Kant's no. Kant's, let's say, slogan that can be interpreted many different ways. One way is right, <laughs> but that's not important for us because we're more interested in what way Shelley chooses, right? So Kant's slogan that can be interpreted many different ways is, in this case, what allows us to put the things together and by allows us to put them together, again, it means it forces us to put these things together and not some other arbitrary things together, right? Like the, oh, the permission here is always really a command. It's a constraint. That's what synthetic propositions require. And Kant says, so right, so in this case, the constraint is experience. Kant agrees with the empiricists. But in this special case, Kant says, the constraint has to do with the form of our faculties or the conditions of possibility of knowledge for beings like us. So we can know that every event is an effect because it would be impossible for thought or representation as we find in ourselves to exist if this law were violated, something like that. This law is a condition of possibility for our being able to think and represent. So that's how we know that these things have to go together and not, for example, event and not an effect of anything. Right, like event and pure chance. We can put those two together without a contradiction. Again, the concept of event doesn't include that it's caused by something, but we can't really put them together because when we put them together, we deny the conditions of possibility of our being the kind of thinking being that we are. So Schelling, so, you know, what does that mean? We know about the conditions of possibility for our own knowledge. What are we knowing about when we know? It's not like knowing that all bodies are heavy, right? I mean, the whole point is it's not supposed to be something we learned from experience. So it couldn't be something we learned from kind of observing our own mind and seeing how it behaves. Um, on the other hand, it seems like it can't be merely analytic. We're not just learning about the concepts of our own mind because then it couldn't have this synthetic consciousness, right? If it was just like 
the mind is a mind. How could you ever get from that the two, the constraint that makes you put some things together and not others? Are there questions about that? I don't know if I expressed it very well. Do people feel like they still know what I'm talking about at all? <laughs> Do you want to go back and ask a question? Yeah. I didn't explain it very well. I've been following along with your thoughts, but I got it. Okay. So, you know, as I said, in some sense, I can't really explain it better than Shelley does, which is bad because Shelley doesn't explain it very well. But the problem is that it can't be explained very well. It's really hard to explain. So, anyway, um, so, uh, so Schelling looks at that and says, and also, as I mentioned before, remembers the key point in Descartes' meditations. What actually is the first principle? What is the first object? And he says, what's going on when we talk about the conditions of possibility for our, no for our knowledge or for the possibility of thinking for beings like ourselves or whatever is, that we're making a very special thing into an object of representation. And the special thing that we're making is the object of the representation is the self. It's not so, it's not just like observing yourself as if you were observing a body or something like that. That would just be another source of experience, and we wouldn't get any farther. Which is the problem, right? And of course, empiricists like Locke are happy to say, "Yeah, there are two sorts of experience: external and internal, sensation and reflection." But that doesn't get us. Um, um, that doesn't get us out of this problem. That's exactly where Hume starts. So, um, so Schelling says, you know, this knowing our own faculties or our own conditions is a very special type of mental act. Um, and that special type of mental act, which is going to, which looks like a proposition, but it's a proposition that is different from all other propositions. It looks like a proposition, self equals self, I equals I. This special um, claim that we make about an agreement between an object, a subject and a predicate, that's the first principle of all knowledge. Now, at that point, he's gone beyond what Kant believed, right? Because remember, Kant said the empiricists are right in general. How do we know that all bodies are heavy? We don't deduce it from anything. We have to experience it. Schelling is saying that actually, if you understand what the self really is, you'll see that everything it knows must follow from this one principle, must be derivable from it somehow. Um, how could you use it to derive that all bodies are heavy? Well, you know, that's why people like Hegel and Schelling write really weird stuff about physical science and, you know, where they try to derive it all from, from abstract principles. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but before you get to that, you have to try to show how you can derive from this, even the most basic facts about the mind, that we have a that we have a faculty of sense and understanding, a will, all that stuff, and that's what Schelling is going to be aiming at more in this book. Um, okay, so right, so this is. You know, and this is generally, I think, what makes the post Kantian idealists post Kantian, and what makes them, as I said, really closer to the rationalists than to the empiricists, is that they try to um, 
they, they first of all interpret that thing about knowing the form of our faculties as a special kind of self-knowledge which goes beyond or is different from knowledge of any other kind of object. And then they try to claim that somehow all our knowledge can be derived from that. Okay, so how, how can we show that this is the first principle of all knowledge? First of all, so, I mean, this is kind of a stopping point. Are there questions before I go on? How much time do I have left? I should be here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I guess, you know, there's two things you could ask at this point. Number one, how do we know if this is the first principle? And number two, how can it function as a principle? How does it establish a condition or a limit that allows us to derive substantive material knowledge from it? Something about the agreement between a subject and a predicate that are not the same. So obviously, so to the, the first one, I guess you'd say, you know, so that it is the first principle. And actually get knowledge of it. So Schelling actually, you know, says that, as I understand it, he thinks that Fichte does this pretty well, but that what he's going to do in his book is this, that is, he's going to show as a matter of fact that this is the first principle of knowledge by actually deriving a system of um, at least fundamental knowledge out of it. But here in part one, he's, he's basically, um, focusing more on this, but you can see from what he says about this, how, you know, what direction he's headed to. And in the reading for next time, we'll see him doing this part. So how can you show that this really is the first principle? Well, um, Schelling says, well, I mean, obviously you can't prove from first principles that it's the first principle. Now, you know, uh, it might not actually be that obvious, but let's let's give him that much. You can't just prove from first principles what the first principle is. So instead, he approaches it this way. He says, okay, suppose there were a first principle of all knowledge, what would it have to be like? So this on page 21 is where he's talking about this. And he says, the proof can proceed. It's kind of like in the middle of page 21, near the beginning of section two, deduction of the principle itself. The proof can proceed only upon the dignity of this principle or upon proving that it is the highest and possesses all those characteristics which appertain thereto. Right, which again, I think means, suppose there were a first principle, what would it have to be like? And then try to show that this and only this proposition is like that. So this must be the first principle. That's the strategy. And that's what he's calling deduction of the first principle. We're gonna um, figure out what the first principle would have to be and then what it would have to be like and then show that it's like that this is the only proposition that's like this. Okay. So what would it have to be like? Well, um, it would have to be the condition of all other knowledge. 
condition, you know, like condition, condition is being used here in a pretty normal way, actually. It's like on the condition that X, only on the condition that X can you have Y, right? So a condition of knowledge is like only on the condition that certain constraints are satisfied can the synthetic proposition be true. So the first principle has to be the thing that conditions everything else, right? Everything else is true on the condition of this first principle being true. So the first principle itself is unconditioned. or absolute. Absolute really is the opposite of relative, not as conditions, right? But in this case, the relation we're thinking about is condition, 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 conditionality, right? So in most things, when we say they're true, we mean they're true on the condition that something else is true. So they're true like relative to that. But the first principle has to be absolutely true. There is no condition on which it's true. And then the question Schelling asks, asks is, okay, suppose there's an unconditionally or absolutely true proposition, is it analytic or is it synthetic? Is it identical or is it synthetic? And he says, well, on the one hand, this analytic principles are, are prior to synthetic ones. Now, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what he means by that, to tell you the truth. I think, I mean, I guess they certainly, the, the law of identity establishes a kind of constraint that every supposed piece of knowledge has to conform to. Right, like if I have a if I have a supposed synthetic piece of knowledge that says B plus not A equals A, then um, I can, without looking into what B or A are, I can see automatically that this can't be true because it violates this. But it's just to say that logical laws are like more fundamental than other types of laws. They, you know, everything else can only be true on a condition that it doesn't violate logical laws, something like that. Is it clear why I'm calling this a logical law? It probably shouldn't be. <laughs> it's because these people think of logic as being about fundamentally about the principle of non-contradiction. Or also, you could say it's about formal or subjective truth, which means it's about the conditions that a presentation has to fulfill in order to count as a presentation at all, without talking about what its object is. So basically, just that it has to be consistent with itself. Um, Whereas here we're talking about material, objective questions, right? Here we're saying, um, well, I mean, suppose this were just, you know, C. Here we're saying, okay, formally it's fine, right? There's no inconsistency in thinking that B plus C equals A. Right, that like lion head plus goat head equals chimera. But the question is, does it refer to a possible object? Am I thinking about anything? Or am I just playing with my own representation? And so when, when Schelling says that the formal or the identical formal subjective principles are higher or prior to these, he means that First of all, the representation has to meet these constraints, and then we can start thinking about this. 
It has to not contradict itself. And then we can start asking, is it the thought of an object or not? So from this argument, it seems like a first principle, an unconditioned proposition would have to be analytic. Right, because if it were synthetic, then it would be conditioned by this, these analytic or identical truths. Um, you probably could, you probably could make that more precise. <laughs> There's probably more than one way to make it more precise. Um, I think I'm saying it as precisely as Schelling says it. <laughs> right? I mean, there's, there's, there's some vagueness involved in like, in what sense do we mean that this is before or prior? In which sense are we saying that it's the identical proposition that constrains this? You know, I, but anyway, that's the thought. That the, so therefore the first principle would have to be analytic. But then Shelley says, on the other hand, how do we know that when we have an identical proposition, how do we know that we're actually thinking about anything? Right? And this is where we get back to those examples where A could be, quote, the, the so called presentation of something impossible. Um, so, um, Shelley says, before we can start asking, before we can start saying that A is the same as A, all horses are horses, all bodies are bodies, we have to be sure that A actually is the thought of something. Um, right? Like all chimeras are chimeras. So actually, like the way we tend to think of that, we'd say it's true. There are no chimeras. Therefore, all, they're all chimeras, and they're also all not chimeras. <laughs> um, but this is not the traditional way of thinking about it. That actually is a way of thinking about it that we owe to Frege, um, for better or worse. But so, but a traditional way of approaching it would be, and this is what Schelling thinks is obvious. When you think all chimeras are chimeras, you're not really thinking anything. There are no chimeras. And especially, even if you think, well, a chimera, you know, there could be a chimera that just doesn't happen to be one, right? But especially if A is something like the highest speed, which, you know, again, it's a good example because there actually is a high speed. But <laughs> anyway, what seems obvious to them, there is, there is and can't be a highest speed. Um, when you think the highest speed is the highest speed, you're not thinking anything. So this on page 20, Schelling says, this is, um, I'm starting around the middle of the big paragraph there in the middle of the page. Um, the logical element in this proposition is merely the form of identity between A and A. But where then do I get A itself from? If A exists, it is equal to itself, but where does it come from? This question can assuredly be answered not from the proposition itself, but only from a higher one. The analysis A equals A presupposes the synthesis A. So it is evident that no formal principle can be thought without presupposing a material principle. And then he says, going back to the first argument, or a material without presupposing a formal one, right? So he says, um, you know, I already argued before that these presuppose these, but now I'm saying these presuppose these because I can't think A is A unless I get A from somewhere. And to get A from somewhere means I have to form a synthetic proposition, right? Some things with lion heads have goat heads sticking out of their back. <laughs> That's synthetic. Then I can say, and all those things are themselves. <laughs> so, um, so the answer apparently is that the first principle can neither be one of these nor one of these. 
or as Schelling puts it, it has to be both. It has to be the, the, the single point where the analytic and synthetic meet, or the analytic, the synthetic and the identical meet. I mean, that's actually how he puts it on page 22, um, number five, towards the bottom of the page. This contradiction would be soluble only if some point could be found in which the identical and the synthetic are one or some proposition which in being identical is at once synthetic and in being synthetic is at once identical. So the criterion that a first principle has to meet is that it has to somehow be both analytic and or identical and synthetic. And if we can find that there's one and only one proposition that fits that, it must be the first principle. Um, Now, so, I mean, this is the first of a number of co apparently contradictory criteria that Schelling is going to give for what the first principle of knowledge has to be like. And again, it seems like something either has to be identical or synthetic. It can't be both. But Schelling is going to try to show over and over again that the contradiction can be resolved, that there's actually a third in between thing that is neither or both analytic or synthetic. Um, and it's in this context that Schelling actually uses. So this has been, uh, this phrase is famously associated with Hegel, but Hegel actually doesn't use this terminology. But Schelling does. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Right? Like the origin of all synthetic knowledge is these apparent conflicts that then get resolved, and that's where the knowledge comes from. So, again, the first one, and the only one I'm going to talk about today anyway is this analytic it has to be anal or identical and synthetic both so what kind of proposition could be analytic or identical and synthetic both so you know here i am again Trying to represent an was trying to rep represent an object using my presentation A. Um, I need an A that somehow has already become an object for me. And then I need to somehow determine that it's also the object of B. And the problem is. Um, that uh, if B is just something I already put into it, then at this, at this point, I'm just summarizing what I said before, I think. If B is just something I already put into it for no good reason, then yes, I can find that B is in there, but I'm not increasing my knowledge. But how can I find something in this that I didn't put in there? <laughs> I mean, um, what is it that can happen just inside my mind where I'm just putting together whatever I want to that somehow creates a constraint on what I can do? <laughs> 
that's the question of how a proposition can be both identical and synthetic, right? Put in a way that makes it sound not quite as hopeless. The question is how, how can something I do in my mind result in there being constraints on what I can think through A beyond what I just put into A? Or to put it the way Schelling does, I have to somehow get from the subjective to the objective. I do something inside my own mind with my own presentations. And yet from that, I get a constraint about what I can think and what I can't. What I can have as an object and what I can't. So I get from the subjective to the objective. Um, and page 24, um, the top of page 24, there is absolutely no explaining how presentation and object can coincide. And again, I would translate agree. There is absolutely no explaining how presentation and object can agree unless in knowledge itself, there exists a point at which both are originally one, or at which being and presentation are in the most perfect identity. So the answer is that the object here must be the subject itself. What I do with my own representation in my own mind creates a constraint on what I can do because that's what I did. <laughs> now, I mean, that makes it sound like I could have done just anything, right? I mean, and this is an objection that people made to Descartes, right? Why not say, I run there for I am, I swim there for I am, yeah. Yes. So, right. Um, well, yes and no. I mean, as we'll see, it's not one takes priority over the other. They one can't take priority over the other because they're the same. It's identical. But in another sense, there is a kind of order to it. And so the, the reason what I was about to say is it makes it sound like I could do anything. Like the constraint is just like I randomly do something. And that's how knowledge begins. Now, I mean, there might be philosophers who think of knowledge beginning that way. Um, but that's uh, yeah. Right, that makes that makes knowledge all dependent on an arbitrary act of my will. But that's not the direction Shelley is going in. So, um, because according to Shelley, the thing that I have to do here. So, what do I have to do to look for a first principle of all knowledge? I have to. Um, pretend I didn't know that there was any object out there that my presentation agreed with, could agree with, right? That is, be a radical skeptic. And then somehow that's going to, that act itself is going to make an object. It's going to make something be my object that wasn't before. Now, I mean, if that sounds super mysterious, think again to how Descartes' argument works in the second meditation. I mean, Descartes usually puts his conclusion by saying, 
that he's shown that he's erased Kobe times, right? A thinking thing. But sometimes when he's more precise, I think he says, race dubitants, a doubting thing. It's the act of doubt has produced the object I'm sure exists, namely a doubting thing. And that's why it's special, right? Because that one mental act produces its object. So, um, the way Schelling puts it is, now, now I am gonna read something from the introduction. Um, Page 13. So, so the, the way Shelley thinks about this is before this act of doubt, um, which turns out to be the act of knowing myself, right? Of finding an object that wasn't any of the original objects. Before that, there was a subject, but it wasn't object of any of presentation. And after that act, it's still the same, but now it has become the object of a presentation. And that changes everything about it. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I said there is an order here. There's a self that's already become an object. And I'm saying that it's the same as the self before it became an object. This again is exactly what happens in the second meditation. There's a past tense verb there, right? It actually, in the, in the argument in the second meditation, what the meditator actually says at the key moments is, I certainly existed if I had convinced myself of something. Yeah. Is there a reason why Schelling, and I think also part, uh, comes to the conclusion that it's the self that's this uh, uncertain thing and not just thinking? Um, well, uh, is there a reason? <laughs> um, there is a reason. It might not be the same reason for Descartes and for Schelling. And it also it might not be the same reason for Schelling's Descartes and it is for my Descartes, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, uh, um, but you know, what Schelling says about this is that Descartes was actually wrong to think that the first principle is I think. Um, Schelling says he should have said the first principle is I am. And um, because I think this is his answer to your question, basically, right? The answer is that when I say, um, I think, or what I've shown to exist is a thinking thing, I don't mean that what I've shown to exist is a thing and thinking. I mean, I mean that the thing I've shown to exist is the thing. So, um, so it is thought itself. That's Schelling's answer, I think. I don't think that's Descartes' answer, but um, so um, it is thinking, except, and this I think this is Schelling's interpretation or what Schelling thinks Descartes should have realized when he has that past tense verb there or whatever, that um, it is just thinking itself. Except now it's different because it's become an object. <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, this is the thing I was going to read on page 13. Um, where is this? 
Uh, it's near the bottom. Through this constant double activity of producing and intuiting, something is to become an object which is not, which is not otherwise reflected by anything. We cannot here demonstrate that we shall in the sequel that this coming to be reflected of the absolutely non-conscious and non-objective. So by non-conscious, he means what we're not conscious of, right? The unconscious representation. We cannot, that this coming to be reflected of the absolutely non-conscious and non-objective is possible only through an aesthetic act of the imagination. This much, however, is apparent from what we have already shown, namely that all philosophy is productive. Right? So this first principle turns out not to be, um, you know, the reason it has these contradictory properties is it's not just something I sit back and think about something out there. It's something I do and thereby produce the first object along with the knowledge of it. Um, and he, what he adds here in parentheses, which is gonna be very important for the people going forward, is that the, the capacity of the self that's involved in this production is the, is the aesthetic imagination. Meaning, I guess you could say to begin with that it's productive and it's self-expressive, right? It's like artistic. I'm making something that represents me, that expresses me. And the first thing I make that expresses me is me. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's not just like a kind of trick or something. It's gonna turn out to, mean that for Schelling and these later 19th century people, art takes this really central position, right? It, it turns out to be um, kind of prior to knowledge and morality because it's the, it's, it's the source of the unconditioned first principle that then those things must are responsible to. Um. Okay, so therefore it's so, I mean, so that's how he tries to show that this is both analytic and synthetic or both identical and synthetic. It's both identical and synthetic because um, it's the same thing being equated to itself, but it's being equated to itself it, as object is being equated to itself as non-object, as subject. And, um, and when he starts deriving consequences for what the self must be like in the next part, it's going to come out of the fact that there's these two, in the original act, there were these two different pieces. It's the same piece, but they're different. <laughs> and in particular, one of them is kind of um, one of them is intuiting or intuitance that is, is pure subject kind of like looking at the other one, which is the intuitive. Right, so the intuitive is this self that's become object and thereby become the subject of a proposition. And the intuitant self is the self that gets equated to that in the first proposition. And the constraint that this establishes, the condition on all knowledge, therefore it turns out to be a practical constraint. If I want to search for a first principle, there's something I have to do. And what I have to do is make myself the object. And that act, that, that necessity of doing that is the first principle. 
right? That is the constraint that, that makes the first principle a principle is a constraint that if I want to look for a first principle, I must do that. So that's why Shelley says, and he says this towards the end of the reading today, that the first principle is not an axiom. It's a postulate. German word for postulate is Forderung, which means like demand, which is actually what postulate also means. So like in um, traditional, like in Euclid's elements, there are axioms and there are postulates. Now, actually Euclid didn't call them axioms, but in the editions of Euclid people had, they were called axioms and they were postulates. So the axioms say, the axioms say things, you know, like um, the whole is greater than the part is one of the axioms. The postulates say things like around any point draw a circle. Right? So that's why it's a demand. You must be able to draw a circle around every point, something like that. So Schelling is saying that the first principle of all knowledge is like that. It tells you what to do. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. Um, this explains how this first principle can have all this coercive power. And yet, um, most people don't acknowledge it. Right? That is, most people don't think that they're deriving their knowledge from this principle, self is for self. Why? Because they don't do it. <laughs> right? They ought to do it. It may be demanded of them that they do it. Um, right? So on page 33, Schelling says, Um, where the postulate gets its coercive power from is it once explained by the fact that it is used for practical demands actually it says is related to practical demands intellectual intuition is something that one can demand and expect any human who lacks the capacity for such an intuition ought at least to possess it So Schelling actually ends up at the end of this part in a kind of dark place, if you pay attention. It's the first principle of all knowledge and all morality. And the first principle is that you ought to do this thing, but most people don't do it. And in fact, many people can't do it, Schelling says. So this is actually gonna look pretty good to Coleridge when he starts to look for a philosophical interpretation of original sin and stuff like that. Um, although, as we'll see in Schelling, it's not quite as bad as it sounds because of the role that he's going to assign to artistic genius in helping other people come to this point. OK, that's all I have time for. Um, pretty much what I intended to say. So I will see you next week. <laughs>